I spend a lot of time in, in markets and wine regions around the world, and I think that uh, probably the least interesting thing for most people is when I say, oh, well, you know, I do a competition in Iowa as well. They're always like, oh, that's nice. Anyway, let's get back to the Rhone Valley. I disagree with them. I think this is probably some of the most interesting stuff that's happening in the world of wine because we're actually creating grapes, sometimes from whole cloth. Um, we're making wines from grapes that people don't know. The world is far more complex than Chardonnay and Cabernet, and has been for quite some time. This is the new frontier. This is where a lot of new varieties are being developed, a lot of hybrids that are very, very interesting. We want everybody making good wine. I want to make the best wine, but I want everybody else to make good wine too, you know. I seen my share of faces with a look that said they ain't quite there. I done my time crawling around the back of my faded mind, but I don't mean to tell you that I know what you know. All I can tell you is if the dirt ain't right, then you're never gonna reap what you sow. In my thoughts, I'll We're not California, we're not France. Uh, we're not making a lot of wine out of Cabernet Sauvignon, which has been made into wine for thousands of years. We're using these hybrid grapes that were developed by University of Minnesota, Cornell University of New York, among others. And some of these grapes have been made into wine for maybe five years, 10, 15. So we're really on the cutting edge of a new industry, but we're making wines they're not making anywhere else in the world. And we need to capitalize on that. We need to stop apologizing for not having a cab or a Merlot. I work, you know, do work with growers and vintners in Ohio and Indiana, and I just, I love the wines. And, and what really, really boils my blood is the ignorance so that, that you come to Iowa and you go to the restaurants and they don't even serve the wines. They're embarrassed by them. They're not real wines. But the people who are going in the tasting rooms they love them. So, so one of the things we've created is a tyranny of the minority of wine experts and critics. They only focus on a tiny number of wines. They overlook all the diversity of these wonderful products that really passionate people are making that I love to spend time with. I'd rather be here in Cedar Rapids at this event than at a big Napa event where everybody's eating it. And all the wines frankly taste the same. These are the fun wines, these are the fun people. You may be surprised to learn the Midwest is experiencing a rebirth of the grape and wine industry. Back at the turn of the 20th century, the Midwest was a grape growing powerhouse. It's true. Unfortunately, the industry ultimately collapsed. Why? Two important historical events, prohibition and later the advent of potent herbicides which are lethal to certain plants. Traditional wine grapes grown in California and France, such as Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon, they aren't tough enough to survive the brutal Midwestern climate. However, by the mid-1940s, private grape breeders working in their backyard vineyards were creating new grapes. 
grapes known as cold climate varieties, or simply hybrids. Hybrids that are tough enough to withstand a Minnesota winter and produce exceptional wines. One of the earliest Midwestern grape pioneers was Elmer Swenson. He truly pushed the grape growing envelope and helped usher in a new frontier. The grandfather of all of this cold climate uh, grape breeding is Elmer Swenson. And Elmer Swenson, uh, of course, worked with the University of Minnesota, but he had developed a lot of grapes on his own uh, uh, way before that. There's a great mystery in this world why Elmer Swenson bred grapes. Because uh, he was a, his parents were Norwegian, his grandfather still, still spoke Norwegian, didn't speak English very well. One of Elmer's earliest memories is walking up and down the vineyard rows with his grandfather. And his grandfather didn't speak English. He came from Norway. What the hell was he doing in Wisconsin, growing grapes? But he was. And Elmer came to the conclusion, I think, that, uh, that this burying thing that his grandfather was doing every year, burying grapevines and pulling them up, it was just a pain in the neck. And uh, uh, I don't know if he was a young man like myself, who was like, oh God, this is a stupid job, or what it was. But in 1943, before anybody else was growing uh, really grapes, there was these homemade things, there was these home grill. There were some vineyards that, uh, that people were growing table grapes, and uh, that was Elmer's primary interest in those days, was table grapes, not wine grapes. He moved into wine grapes. Well, he had friends in the business that would take things he developed and do the wine end of it. And when they found something that they thought made nice wine, then he would see how it was in the vineyard, and if it was something that people wanted, he would very selflessly let them take it and start growing it. So he lived about 20 miles east of here, and um, two or three times a year, I would go over and spend the day with Elmer, and we would walk through the vineyard, and he would tell me <laughs> what this particular vine, out of the thousands of vines he had there, what this particular vine was, what his parentage was, uh, whether it was early or late, you know, um, he just had uh, just a head full of grape knowledge. Yeah, this is uh, 5, 4, 18, and uh, it's uh, a rather uh, weak growing plant uh, of itself, but these are, are grafted plants. They're uh, on the a very fine rootstock selection that I have, the 1553, which is an open pollinated seedling of uh, Minnesota 78. My favorite story about Elmer, he was 89 years old and he was still out in the vineyard. He said, I just can't work like I used to. He says, I, I do the best I can, but I, I just can't work like I used to. He says, I wish I was 10 years younger so I could work harder. Tom says, how many of us wish we were 79 years old so we could work on it? <laughs> he says, that's, that's, that's a reflection of Elmer, who he was. I mean, he was so successful. I mean, we, you know, there are probably 25 or 30 different varieties of his that are named and in commercial use somewhere in the world. It's amazing. I mean, he was making his contribution, like when, when you'd accept wood from him and say, you gotta pay. We gotta pay for this wood, you know, these hybrids that you've got. He'd say, no, you're helping me, I'm not helping you. So that was his, that was his plan. And uh, he died um, in 2004 and uh, uh, had dedicated the latter half of his entire life to, uh, to um, creating a grape industry. There's kind of a, there's kind of a, an interesting um, dichotomy, you might say, I guess, in that um, a lot of the people that followed Elmer's work had a great deal of resentment toward the university because when the university got into grape growing, all of a sudden it became a public knowledge. Before that, Elmer was doing this odd thing, but when the university invested money in it and started a program and hired people to hybridize new grapes, all of a sudden the public realized there was something to this. And people like myself had already been, I didn't hybridize, but I was growing grapes, you know, and, and selling table, table grapes at that time. Um, people uh, um, 
uh, went from being very skeptical of what all of us early people were doing. All of a sudden we had credibility we'd never had before. And the industry, when the, in the university came into it, and you can say whatever you want about the varieties that they've come forward with, when they came into it, grape growing became a mainline thing. All of a sudden we had, we had the skepticism just disappeared. So we have really two kinds of industries. One that is primarily using French hybrid grapes as well as northern grapes, and they are primarily uh, located in southwest and southeast corner of the state. Whereas when you come to the northern part of the state, uh, the winters are very cold, and the only grapes that will survive and grow well uh, and produce economic levels of crops are these uh, northern grape varieties, which were developed by uh, Elmer Swanson and other private breeders, as well as University of Minnesota. Grapes like Brianna and La Crescent and uh, Marquette and Frontenac, those kind of grapes. You know, what's, what's great about the cold climate grape industry is we just don't have like five signature vinifera grapes or French grapes. We've got about 40 grapes that we're making wine out of here. So that every time you go out to a wine, cold climate grape winery in the upper Midwest, it's an adventure because they may have 10, 12, 15 different wines. It's great, you know, and that's variety. Now you also have to face the challenge of, oh, they can't make wine in Iowa. Well, I'm actually old enough to know when that's how California used to be held. Oh, they can't make, and I used to think that. I was raised on French wines and classic, you know, Italian and whatever. They can't possibly make wine in California, but look where that is today. They're vibrant, they've got good flavors, they've got good length, and most importantly, they've got good balance. And balance to me is a key on it from any region. Uh, you want them, and you know, they taste good. They, you, they invite you to have a second glass. Some of the monster overripe uh, wines we're coming and seeing out of the West Coast, you take one sip and go, that's interesting, and you don't want any more. With these wines, you want another glass. They're just tasty. So we're looking for the perfect grape we can grow in this area, that we can make our mark, and that we can grow better than anybody else. It's not our mission to grow Cabernet and Merlot, it's our mission to find our own niche and, and perfect it. So, you know, the California grapes have been around for hundreds of years and we've just been at it for maybe, you know, 30, 40 years. So we, have, we still have a long way to go, but we're, we're closing in on it. So that's what makes it fun for me. And so what they're doing today here in the Midwest in general, on the Great Lakes, in Minnesota and whatever, actually is truer to how wine used to be in France 50 or 60 years ago. It truly is. And, and the wine experts don't know this. So it's time to, for people to, to, if you're in the winery, celebrate the diversity of people, celebrate the people who love sweet wines and make them feel confident, give them a, a, an experience that has them go out and go into the restaurant and say, hey, where's wine for me, you moron? One thing that's unique about this new wine region is that it tends to be centered around families, generational farm families with deep roots and an intimate knowledge of their land. Few would have thought this new wine industry would attract world-class winemakers, and even fewer would have imagined that of all things, grapes could help restore the family farm. First day at work, it was February 10th of 2014, and it was 16 below zero was the temperature with a wind chill about 40 below. And of course, living on the property, I, it's a slight uphill to the winery. I got to put on Facebook to all my California friends, I walked uphill in 40 below zero weather to work today, and they really thought it was crazy. <laughs> I mean, I never would have thought, you know, moving to Minnesota would have been the best job I ever had in my life. And, uh, you know, it's, we live in this home that was built in 1860 on the property, it, 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 that's, and that's where the name came from. It was a homestead and it was a farm. It's been basically a working farm for 155 years. And the owner who owned it for 70, 60 years is now almost 100 years old, and he comes by and his kids come by and, and check on the home even now. So it's just, you know, as I say, Minnesota nice and Midwest people are just really welcoming, fun people. And, and that's, 
you know, and not that I didn't enjoy my time in California, but I feel more at home in a year and a half in Minnesota than I did 22 years in California. And maybe that's because I grew up in Tennessee. I was not from California, but it's, uh, we, we absolutely love it. You know, when Mike, our winemaker, came to interview, I think when he went downstairs to see the winery, he immediately realized this wasn't garbage cans and garden hoses. This was the real McCoy. And that was good for him. Uh, that was important to him because Mike comes from a background where he has 90 plus wine specter ratings on his wine and he wants to continue it forward. And so the way he looks at, he looks at Chankaska is here I have an opportunity to enter a new frontier. You know, the, these cold climate grapes are, are, I think, really neat. I mean, for, for now we have, we have the ability in two rings around the world to grow grapes we never had before that can produce wine. I mean, that's, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. So it's really neat. Uh, it's much harder to grow good grapes in the Midwest than it was in California. One of the uh, California winemakers once said to me, hell, any gorilla can make wine in California. But when you're here, given the weather you run into, the high humidity, the warm evenings, it makes it much more difficult. Pinot Noir, for example, needs cool evenings. You don't get that most of the time in the Midwest. So there's a whole range of grapes, hybrids, and Native American varietals that they have to work with. And that makes it even more complex. This is hard stuff. This is people working, and, and these are truly unique and diverse and, and exciting wines for me. Compared to California, growing grapes in the Midwest and making wine takes guts. If you haven't spent much time in the heartland, one thing you may notice is that some of us may seem mild-mannered. Don't let it fool you. These hardworking families are determined to compete globally. They have strong roots, often several generations deep. I'm the fifth generation farmer here in, uh, in, in Iowa. We grow corn and soybeans. And uh, back in about 10 years ago, we decided to diversify. So we jumped in and uh, basically said, you know, life's too short. If we're gonna jump off this cliff and start in the wine business, we're gonna do it. And we're gonna do it now and we're gonna do it fast. Because it takes three years get going. We, we put in a vineyard, small at first, and then we kept expanding on it, expanding on it. And uh, now it's about 9,000 plants, about 14 acres total. And uh, it produces about somewhere between 35 and 40,000 bottles of wine a year. I don't think we even had any clue that we would be where we are today. It was an idea that blossomed and then it just keeps built, getting a life of its own. When we went to our banker and uh, said, you know, we're gonna put a vineyard in and make a winery. And as a banker, first thing they'll say, well, what do you know about making a wine? Tastes good. <laughs> so you had to get over that. But again, we had enough equity sitting around and we owned the ground that that wasn't too big of a problem. But getting everybody in the area to believe in you there was a lot of people in the local community would look at me and say, you know, you're not gonna make this work. And a lot of people laughed at us. We thought they were, they thought we were crazy to do this. And uh, it didn't take long before we changed their, their minds what we were doing. Didn't really look back after that point. The only uh, hard part was I didn't know who my winemaker was gonna be. You know, I sent all three of my kids to college. Surely one of them was smart enough to be a winemaker. And so, I called him up and I talked to my daughter, Cassie. I told her I wanted her to be my winemaker. And her first comment was, Dad, have you been drinking? Our plan today is to pick until around noonish. Kind of depends on how well we're doing with picking grapes. Even though the industry is rapidly growing, few vineyards in the upper Midwest are large enough to warrant mechanized harvesters. Wine growers need to be creative in finding ways to harvest their grapes. That often means asking friends, family, and even winery customers to be a part of their picking team. Before this is our second adventure, it's kind of fun for us girls to get away, and it's actually kind of relaxing, believe it or not. It's not a whole lot of work, and doing something just 
girly. Yeah, farm labor. Girly. Yeah. <laughs> farm labor, yeah. But one thing you gotta remember about us as a family, we're very driven. We work hard and we work every day of the week. Even the bankers know that we'd make it successful. Oh, I'm very, very proud, you know, and I, you know, I always gave Zach kudos at first because he had to come to work with his mother-in-law every day. <laughs> that took a lot. <laughs> Not everybody can do that. So we tore it all apart, cleaned it up, put some propylene glycol on it, and it works. That's it. It's easy, right? Nothing to this shit. Um, when Cassie joined us, she was also looking for a career change, and it was a, you know, we get, told her, give us six months and decide if you want to be in a family situation, because this is, you know, not everybody can do it. Not everybody can be with that person, you know, 24 seven. Um, and so she's done well. I mean, we, even though we're here all the time, sometimes we don't talk to each other that much. Our family was going to relocate probably, and could have been great, um, but not sure that we really wanted to be four or five hours away from our you know, we have young kids, and it's nice to be really close to our grandparents and cousins, and um, so that that has been fun. Um, did I ever dream that I was going to live basically in my backyard growing up and work in Marengo, Iowa? No, but it's, it's been good. So I've learned a lot about an industry I knew nothing about, um, so I like it. I enjoy it a lot. I mean, we don't always agree on everything, but for the most part, we get along. And if you can get the four of us to agree on something, you're in pretty good shape. So, because we have four very distinct personalities and four different ideas of what's good, um, not only in like landscaping, but in wine and marketing and anything. So, if the four of us can come, and we almost always do. Um, I can't think of any major decision we've ended up disagreeing on. So, but yeah, if we can come to a conclusion, usually it works out pretty well for us. Mark was a cash crop farmer. I worked for the state of Wisconsin. Before that, I worked with my father as a, as a plumber. And we both decided in retirement we were interested in keeping the family homestead a family homestead. And how would you possibly do it? So our daughter, Laura, um, was curling in Italy, in northern Italy. And we decided to go watch her in semifinals and finals because we knew she'd get there. So we went to Rome and we went to Venice and toured. And on the way, we found out that Coca-Cola was $5 a can in Italy and red wine was $2 a glass. <laughs> so we decided to try red wine and it was low alcohol and it was smooth. And I came home and went to a store and said, can you give me something like an Italian red? And they gave me a Pinot Noir, an Oregon Pinot Noir. And that's when we started loving wine. And then I was gonna retire from the state and I wanted something to do so I wouldn't be bored. I'm a master plumber, but I didn't wanna do that again. So I planted grapes in front of the house. And then pretty soon everybody else wanted to plant grapes. And Mark always says, do the math. And the math said we couldn't make enough money for three families off grapes. Unless we had a lot of grapes. The one thing growing up and everything, uh, as my grandpa tried to um, and successfully grew his farming business, is he actually started in this area of ground that is um, the hills. It's clay loam. I mean, Illinois is known for extremely fertile soils. Where we're sitting here, it's not fertile. It's very clay, rocky loam soils. You know, the corn and soybeans don't grow great here. Um, and so when this came to that whole idea of grapes and learning that, hey, grapes don't want fertile soil is they want to struggle. They want, because they want to put, work harder because then it puts more energy into the grapes. Um, it acts as like, 
wait, we, we kind of have the land almost ideal for growing grapes. The fact is, compared to traditional wine growing regions such as California, growing wine grapes in the upper Midwest comes with its own unique set of challenges. You know, my first question is, how do you grow grapes here? I know it's you know, obviously it gets very cold here. It's almost better that we're so far north that we can't even attempt to make Cabernet or Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. It just wouldn't grow here. So we're making outstanding wines with grapes that a lot of people have never heard of, but I think they, that's going to change here in the next five or ten years. I think that the reality of growing grapes in the Midwest is not being realized. I think it's very difficult. Nobody's been growing grapes longer than I have. I grew up with it. The vineyard is super problematic. Uh, I cannot depend upon a crop every year. It's not a 2012, which was a fantastic year, because 2012, we had the, the frosts in April, but we had a super warm March, so everything was already budded by April, and then we lost half the crop, so the load on the grapes was very small, and so what we got out of it was really high-quality grapes but not very many, huh? that's farming. You know, no two years are alike here. Minnesota weather, I mean, you might get one year, you get a lot of rain and not the sunshine you need to make good quality fruit. So then it's a matter of dealing with that and adjusting in your vineyard and uh, making some changes there to try and bring that fruit along and make quality fruit out of it. The next year you might get a real hot, dry summer that makes really nice fruit. And you know, almost anybody can raise good fruit or at least a better quality fruit. And it's, it's really a challenge. And then you get all the winter conditions, which it don't matter what you do. If you get a bad winter and a bad, bad warm up at the wrong time, all of a sudden you can lose half your crop for the next year already because of damage to the grapevine that you've, you have no control over. So. You know, it's not like California where you got sunshine after day after day after day and you can kind of spoon feed the water to them to get just what you want. It's a challenge out here. And cold climate grapes are in, in up at upper Midwest. They have to withstand negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. Up in Minnesota, North Dakota, they're negative 40, you know. So we have to have really tough grapes, you know, versus the the vinifera or French grapes in California and the southern part of the United States, you know, they can withstand maybe negative five and they're goners, man, you know, and most of them are really hurting at zero degrees Fahrenheit. So the cold climate industry is, uh, grape industry is unique in the fact that we have very adverse weather conditions, that cold weather, and it's uh, remarkable that we could even grow wine grapes up here, but we do some pretty good ones at that. The rules governing the wine industry are not the same everywhere. Laws can vary widely between states in terms of shipping, distribution, taxes, and even where the grapes must be grown. As you might expect, this can cause a lot of confusion and frustration. I think our greatest challenge for winemakers, especially where we live, is because we live on the intersection of Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois. It's absolutely crazy that we can't go five miles from here and legally sell wine to either state. But we can have customers from Chicago, New York, and all over. It's perfectly legal for them to buy it here and take it home. But we can't, like, do a tasting there. We'll get in trouble with the feds. Now, that see, some of these laws don't make any sense, OK? A lot of the rules that we have are rules that they created in the 30s when they decided to get rid of prohibition. So the, the, the federal government and created all these rules, and the, the states basically followed them at that point. And so a lot of things that we try to change or try to make it easier to do business are still kind of held in place by those original rules written in like 1936. We pay in the Iowa industry, you know, every, every gallon that I wholesale out of my winery, I pay an excise tax. We pay the third highest excise tax in the United States on the wine we produce. And I have never heard one of our wineries say, hey, we need to talk to the state about getting that reduced. What they want is for some of those tax dollars that we're generating to come back to us in support of the Midwest uh, Grape and Wine Industry Institute at Iowa State. And now we're talking about building a teaching winery, uh, either on Iowa State campus or DMACC campus, to where we can, as we grow this industry, have highly trained uh, individuals working in the wineries, uh, working in our vineyards to help 
improve the quality and consistency of our wines. The uh, law that requires me to produce 51% of my grapes from my vineyard. Uh, I think it's very interesting to be growing grapes. I love the vineyard, I love working in the vineyard. But I think that um, it uh, binds me. It means that I have to make wine from a specific number of grape varieties, which limits my choice as a winemaker. I should have the ability to choose my product. You want to go to Cargill and tell them that they can only produce uh, their products from a couple different strains of corn? Or tell a local beer producer that they can only use a couple different strains of hops? Uh, that's the creativity, is choosing the grape that you're going to make your wine from. So if I'm forced to grow grapes that I have no interest in and making wine from grapes that I'm not interested in, well, maybe I'm not going to make the best wine. So I'd like the choice and the freedom to be able to make the wines that I want to make. They're all waiting for us. Yeah. You hear him calling, Michael. Prune me. Prune me, Dad. I never thought today could be so. Never. Never thought right. today could never. be like. A day like one you see on TV. Never much amounts to anything. Turning out to be so I was an anthropology and sociology major with a minor in theater and media from a small school in Memphis, Tennessee, which is where I grew up, and utterly unemployable. And uh, I, I was actually a bottle of 87 Jordan Cabernet that I tried in probably 91 or 92 that was that aha moment that I was just, this is way better than anything I've ever tried. And so I literally kind of looked on a map, no internet 25 years ago or whatever. Found a book and the, you know, Napa and Sonoma seemed to be the place to be, so I literally packed everything up, a couple dogs and a car, and drove cross country and knocked on a door at Deloach Vineyards, and Randy Ellum was the winemaker there, now he's the head head guy for Kendall Jackson, and he basically was blown away that I just driven cross country, so he gave me a job. This is in March of 93. And then, uh, you know, I married a girl, a woman from Wisconsin, we met in California, and we, uh, and I'm originally from Tennessee, and a couple years ago, we started thinking you know, with our daughter, who was seven at the time, we wanted to be in your family. And I've always enjoyed coming to Wisconsin, the Midwest, and and uh, we kind of started thinking about it. But as a winemaker, I was like, what am I going to do? And so we kind of put it on the back burner. And then lo and behold, uh, Chankaska was looking for a winemaker, and it just kind of fell into place. So we moved here a year and a half ago from California. For me, it's just kind of connecting with roots. Um, Things like the school system is amazing here. My daughter actually transitioned fairly well and, and just loves it here. And also the country piece, living in this home on this piece of land, we, we just could never do something like that in Napa. It's just way too expensive. So we're kind of really enjoying, you know, living in the country, in the vineyard, like a winemaker should in the family. The vineyard was planted in 1973 by my father, who was definitely in the pioneer spirit. Nobody had been really doing this before here. Uh, there weren't any cold climate grapes available for him then as there are now. You know, my father always said, if you want to be a winemaker, you got to know what wine tastes like, because ultimately that's the most important thing is making wine on the hedonistic scale, not making it in a lab, but making wine that tastes good. Now, my best wine that I make, I call it Voyageur, 
which we named after the tradition of the voyageurs who are also pioneers and worked very hard to get their birch bark canoes, <laughs> you know, down the St. Lawrence Seaway into the river system and establish the trading posts in Minnesota. Alexis Bailey, who we named the winery after, uh, he was a pioneer and settler who was supported by the voyageurs. So my voyageur wine is my wine made from my grapes. We make it from the French hybrids that my father originally planted, along with one of the new hybrids from the University of Minnesota called Frontenac. Uh, and it's the best wine. The first year I produced that wine in 2005, uh, it was named the uh, best wine made in the United States at the Atlanta International Wine Competition. Uh, that's a hybrid wine from a Minnesota vineyard. So yeah, I can make some good wines from uh, these grapes. Along with quality, there are a number of other hurdles in doing wine business in the Upper Midwest. First among those is customer acceptance of the wines. Many consumers have preconceptions of what really makes a great wine, typically something from California, dry and red. Not many people are familiar with grape varieties such as Marquette or La Crescent, but these new wines are delicious. Balance is the key. To achieve balance, winemakers sometimes choose to leave a little residual sugar in their wines. The sweetness offsets the acidity and tartness, which makes the wines smoother and easier to drink. Their natural brightness also means they are perfect companions for meals. These winery owners have a keen sense of business and agriculture, and among the corn and bean fields of the heartland, they have found a way to create a new industry. If you remember back to uh, 2000, there wasn't an agricultural commodity produced in Iowa that was uh, returning enough to just cover the uh, input costs of production. And so a lot of us were looking around for the next big thing. And so what, what can we uh, do and uh, what, what kinds of things can, uh, can we produce in Iowa? And we decided to take a careful look at, uh, uh, at uh, vineyards. And of course, if you're gonna grow grapes, you better start figuring out where you're gonna sell them. So that led to the winery. I spent a lot of time researching the wineries in California. Um, I worked with a consultant from California who is a, is a you know, high wine spectator rated winery, winemaker, I should say, um, friend of a friend. Um, just spent a lot of time looking into best practices. Uh, the, the industry is a challenge as it is because you've always gotta have, it's a little cash needy. So you got to have cash, but the point is you got to start with a facility that gets you to a certain point. Um, a lot of wineries, I think, they get themselves in a situation where when they start the winery, they go from, I want to go grapes to, I want to make wine, and then they go, well, that's pretty good wine, now i got to make more, and then they realize all the things they have to deal with. And there's some point in time when they've got to realize they got to make a quantum leap. And so what I decided was, I want to I start here, where I already have achieved all those things and not build to them. Now, a couple of things as I started investigating the whole idea, and this is long before we committed any cash to the project, uh, was that I, I became aware that Iowans didn't consume much wine. And first anecdotally, but within a, a short time, a little bit of investigation showed that our per capita consumption was about 1.6 gallons. And that compared to the national average of about two and a half gallons. And in, in Illinois, uh, just across the Mississippi River, they consume 3.2 gallons. Well, the, the thing about you know, wineries in the Midwest, I mean, people are pretty open-minded and they'll come in and try wine anywhere. Um, but if they don't find something that's pretty nice, it's hard to get them back a second time. And, and that may, that probably goes any place, but with our growing challenges and things like that, I think it's even more of a challenge out here because, you know, the real wine connoisseurs, they got this, they almost got imprinted in their mind that, well, if it isn't a good Cab or Merlot or Pinot Noir or something that can't be good. And, uh, but if the ones that have an open mind are finding that this Marquette and these La Crescents and things like that, are good quality wine, but the winemaker has to do their job and, and make it that way too. The, uh, the usual rap for wines, of, of particularly the Midwest, has been that they're too sweet. 
and that uh, the grapes, we haven't heard of the grapes before. And, and I, would, I would argue against most of that. I think some of it's true. Certainly there's a lot of sweet wines made here. In general, the grapes that we're working with here tend to have a, a, a higher level of tartness to them. And so if you want to make a balanced wine, you actually end up kind of leaving some sugar in there. That's to say you don't ferment all the sugar into alcohol and, and you end up with a wine that's a little bit lower in alcohol, which I think is a good thing. And, but you end up with a little bit of uh, better balance is the presumption because of the, the tartness that you sort of start with. A tartness that's greater than the tartness in a Cabernet or the tartness in, a, in most Chardonnays, certainly in California Chardonnays. So there's some sweetness. Yep, no, getting around it. And some people are going to have a problem with that. And that, you know, that's fine. But there's a lot of dry wine made here. I love something sweet. How come you took it on the list or put it in the stupid dessert wine category? I want it with my steak. I want it with whatever I have. So we have a, we've really made up this mess that puts the lid on these wonderful regions, the wonderful people that, that work harder here than they do in the Napa Valley. All you have to do is a lot of money, hire a celebrity winemaker, get a bunch of new French oak and try and get as many Parker points for a wine that tastes the same as every one of your neighbors, in my opinion. There's all sorts of grapes today that are grown uh, and, and sold successfully in the U.S. market that are unusual, like Grunewald Liener out of, out of Austria, or Albarino from Spain, or, or uh, Nero d'Avola from, from Sicily. Nobody would heard of those 10 years ago. Now they sell like gangbusters. So I don't think that's really a legitimate complaint anymore. I think that's the, uh, it's a kind of a lazy complaint that you hear, usually out of an older generation who really did just get weaned on a handful of grapes. But the younger generation is like, I don't care. Is it good? I'll drink it. You know, I, I guess I can start. Uh, you know, we're not we're not that old, so our palate's not as seasoned as these <laughs> these individuals. However, when we had their uh, sweet uh, El Mar Rosa, it, we fell in love with wine. So we were just starting to get into exactly. We were <laughs> we were just starting to get into tasting wines and stuff. We had just gone to Napa Valley, and so far uh, El Mar Rosa, this red wine that we're drinking right now, is the best that I've ever had. So that's what's kept me coming back and then obviously the you know the people that own the place and run it has made a really good combination for us. When dad sold everything in the farm and had all of this stuff and put it all into wine work and everything said here's your inheritance don't screw it up. We thought about this plan for a few years before we did it we had a, our farm auction uh, March 15th 2010 and sold all my big my big tractors my combine trucks and everything, and they just went. And we had a like kind exchange, so we turned right around and invested all that money into tanks and the press and... and tractor. And yeah, a small tractor. And uh, for the vineyard, so my 435 horsepower tractor turned into a 55 horsepower tractor. And his combine turned into two stainless steel tanks or something. Or a press, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or a mobile bottling line. Yes, oh yeah, the mobile bottling mm -hmm. line, that was quite an investment there. Yeah. And it kind of all fit together, you know, Laura has the chemistry background, her dad has the uh, farming background for over, you know, 40 years. Her mom's one of these people that can pretty much do anything, and your brother with the uh, hospital and tourism, so it was a perfect fit. And I have a marketing background in, in uh, sales and distribution, so it was just a perfect, it, it just kind of like all these stars align, and it just worked out mm -hmm. perfectly. I wanted to work out in the vineyard originally, but because I was scared to death of making wine. And then I went to the classes and fell, fell for the neatness of making wine. That it wasn't just about artistry. There is quality control. There is technical aspects that I can apply. And I don't have to just use that. Mom's, mom's the off the wall, hey, let's throw these together and see what they go like. And I'm going, what? I don't know if I can handle this. But I can break it down and I can do the lab work and it's a blast. We named our um, August Hill Winery. We have August Hill Winery, an Illinois sparkling company. Um, it, it was my grandpa's property, and his name was August Engelhop. And he actually passed away a few years prior to us even starting the winery. So he had no clue that this was to come to be. I was extremely close to my grandpa. I used to farm with him as well as my engineering work. I, I was doing both because I loved the farming background. 
We've always been on the hillside, and um, we kind of took advantage of the, you know, the land itself, and we, uh, um, you know, trying to be the most sustainable, or trying to take advantage of the sustainability of, of the land and what we have within our environment. Um, we decided to go underground, um, so the area that we sit here has no heating or cooling at all. And, and you know, that's one of the big expenses within the entire wine industry is cooling. They ideally would like to keep their cellars at 60 degrees and that's why, you know, um, it's quite cool. Uh, and here, that's the natural temperature of the ground. So 58, 60 degrees year round. So um, we were able to take advantage of that and with the property and, and create that. So the, um, and also in a darker environment so the wine can just age in here, quiet um, and, and uh, in a cool spot. The reality of farming in the heartland is that traditional grain farmers and others use weed killers to protect their plants. There are a host of herbicides in use today, and that poses one of the greatest threats to grape farmers. Grapevines are incredibly sensitive to these potent chemicals. To be successful, vineyard operators need to be proactive and coordinate with chemical spray applicators. This predicament is one of the most significant challenges to growing grapes in the Midwest. There is a place for vineyards among traditional row crop farmscape. It's just gonna take patience, understanding, and sometimes a lawsuit to settle damage claims. In time, grape growers hope to build awareness of their newly emerging crops located so close to the corn and bean fields. In the late 1920s, Iowa was the, um, one of the largest, fifth largest grape producing state in the Union. And uh, two things happened to those, those grapes. Number one was prohibition. The second one was the introduction of 2,4-D chemicals. 2,4-D is an herbicide that's specific for broadleaf um, plants. That's why it's used on corn. So 2,4-D is actually taken up by all tissues of um, broadleaf plants. And um, it actually acts as a false trigger to cause um, growth in the plant. And it ca causes growth that's not differentiated. So it's almost like having a cancerous cell in a body where cancer grows and the cells are tumor-like. In plants, there's plant cell growth, but the cells don't have a function. And what happens is that it essentially takes so much energy from the plant to have those um, affected, affected cells grow that it kills the plant. Four years ago, we had a uh, commercial spray uh, operator spray a cornfield that was located about 600 yards southeast of our vineyard. And the wind that day was blowing out of the southeast towards our vineyard. And we saw the sprayer spraying, and we thought, well, they must know there's, a, they could see the vineyard was here. And uh, the wind that day was uh, anywhere from 8 to 12 mile an hour. And on the label it says if you're anywhere near a sensitive site, especially a grape, grape uh, vineyard, you cannot spray. So they didn't acknowledge that. And they sprayed 2,4-D, they sprayed acetochlor, and they also sprayed glyphosate, which is Roundup. And all those three products came across, hit the vineyard, and we lost over 2,000 plants, and one of the one one of the one of the grapes that was hardest hit was our Marquette, and then the rest of the grapes had severe damage because some of these chemicals have growth uh, uh, hormones in them, so the grapes would try to put on clusters again at the wrong time of the year, and they try to do um, put on vines to protect themselves, and so we lost tonnage in the rest of the vineyard, plus we lost 2,000 plants. It was devastating. I mean, and it, and it was, you know, it's hard because the, to putting those grapes in and then I'm sure that he told the same thing. You know, it's such a, they're so labor intensive and they're like your little teeny tiny babies. And then to see them taken away, you know, it was, it was very, I mean, it was heartbreaking to be out there and see that happen. And, you know, it just, it hurt. 
where do these herbicides come from? Well, cemeteries, schoolyards, all the turf people use them. The farmers are using them for corn and they use them for brush control and pastures. Some of our worst drift cases are like cemeteries or you don't want to, you know, that in a golf course, you know, you gotta be real careful. Uh, so we're all, you know, it's, they're, they're being used widespread. It's always gonna be a challenge, I think, always. I mean, you can go over and threaten your neighbors or tell them about, give them information and stuff. Um, but I think it'll be common for everybody to probably get little whiffs of drift on their vineyards and hopefully it's not too severe. Uh, because I have had friends like Ted Kearns in Platteville whose his vineyard was nearly wiped out with some 2,4-D drift. And even if you do get hit with it pretty hard, you can document it, you can try to go after somebody, maybe sue them, but if your vine's not like completely killed off and still kind of alive, it's hard to make the suit and really come up with what was that worth besides maybe loss of crop for that year. Now we got the GMO concern, genetically modified organism plants. And now uh, we've got Dow Chemical and, and they've got a soybean now that's resistant to 2,4-D. So we're gonna have 2,4-D going on soybeans too. And Monsanto has a soybean coming out that's resistant to dicamba or banville. So we're gonna have soybeans being treated by dicamba. They changed the bean itself. So basically before, if you sprayed dicamba, which is 2,4-D, on a bean, the bean would die. Now they genetically modified it where it's tolerant to, di to dicamba or 2,4-D. And so there's gonna be thousands and thousands of more acres in states that grow grapes that are gonna be multi, you know, you know more at risk of, of, of spray damages. The quality just continues to amaze me. When I left for the very first competition, I turned to my wife and said, this is gonna be grim, but I gotta keep smiling. And I was wrong, because they were really good wines. And as time goes on, they're getting better and better. The wineries are gaining more experience, both with the grapes they're growing and with the uh, winery techniques. So we've been real impressed with the jump in quality. There are so many interesting varieties here. And today, for example, we tasted the most stunning round of Vignol that we had the hardest time deciding the best of this round. There were multiple golds, really beautiful expression of fruit, very compelling on the palate, and finishing with a streamline of flavors, just really elegant and beautifully made, very well-crafted wines. We've had a long time to figure out Pinot Noir and Merlot and Syrah and Chardonnay and all that. And so when somebody does a really good job of it, that's great, but often they're just mirroring the work of someone before them. When somebody makes a really lovely Vignol or a really lovely Brianna or Edelweiss or any of these new grapes, essentially new grapes for us, this is somebody who's really pioneering. And that's pretty cool. I think that's very, very cool. It truly is the pioneering attitude of these Midwestern wine families that's opening the door to new and exciting wines. Young, lively red wines, aromatic whites, and one of the most thrilling turn of events is the burgeoning new scene of sparkling wine. Looking forward, it's clear that these cold climate grapes perfectly lend themselves into being crafted as champagne-style wines, delicious sparkling wines that perfectly express the soils of the heartland. The one thing is, is I drink plenty of my wine at plenty of occasions. And so to create a good palate, I feel like you need to keep it open to everybody's wine. And so we always try other wines. Well, all of a sudden we started drinking sparkling wine. And I started learning that champagne is, um, why champagne came to be, is it's high acid, low tannins. It's like, wait. Champagne, they don't even do that. So it, it actually, and then when I started playing around with it in 2008, it was like, it, it, it's, only, it's really the natural component of the grapes of the Midwest. So it's like, I don't even have to really do very little of the things of trying to make it building up the tannins or lowering the acidity as I'm embracing it. I 
aesthetically, this bubbly is stunning. First of all, the color is beautiful, it's crisp, it's clear, it's, you can tell it's elegant just by looking at it in the glass. Um, the bubbles, if you can see those on camera, I hope you can. They're just absolutely stunning. And if we had a Riedel glass with a little etch in the bottom, you'd see these bubbles coming right up the center. They're beautiful and tiny, they're consistent, and they're long-lasting. I've been holding this glass for how long? I don't know, since I've been talking over there, now I'm over here. Check that out, stunning. So I, I'm very excited about sparkling wine future in Upper Midwest. I, I think uh, um, sparkling wine, uh, aromatic white wines, and young uh, or fruity red wines for early consumption is the way to go. Those three styles and three types would be excellent. The tropical fruit aromas that we get out of La Crescent seem to almost surpass any of the other French hybrids that we've had so far uh, to this point. Um, so it's really those aromas that we're all about with here and that's what works with the sparkling is those aromatic properties. In addition to, it does have higher acids maybe, acid levels than its sister grapes like La Crosse St. Pepin um, and Saval. And that works with the sparkling wine as well because you want that big crisp finish on it. But that's why I've also started to make it into a cuvee. And so the other part of the blend is the Edelmina, which is in another row down here. And it has softer acid levels, but also nice aromatics. And so putting the two together has kind of um, created an, an even, even better bubbly. <laughs> Merle's idea that the Midwest grapes are begging to be made into, into sparkling wine, I think uh, there's, there's really uh, something there. It can be, uh, for one thing, it can be a way to distinguish our region from others. Um, as it is a cold climate and we do have unpredictable seasons, um, sparkling wine could potentially minimize the risk of those, of the variation we see from, from year to year. So we have the acidity, we have a lot of grapes that are, are really great, make great champagne. We have uh, Aramella, New York 76, now it's called Aramella. We have La Crescent makes an excellent champagne. And I'm sure there's a lot of other varieties, but being an estate winery, this is what we grew, so this is what we used. So hopefully next year we might get our hands on a different variety just to see what's going to happen. Our white grapes tend to have a lot of aroma. Traditionally, you try to minimize that varietal aroma because you want the, uh, the yeast in the bottle to, to actually give, give the wine its aroma. But um, our varieties tend to be less neutral. You know, they have a lot of character, but uh, we don't have to try to make a perfect champagne. We can make a great Minnesota sparkling wine. When we think about this style, is, is we're looking for something that's very fun, very easy drinking. You know, the one thing that we've adopted into our nomenclature, especially in this wine, is uh, we look for this poof effect. And when you drink sparkling wine, um, sparkling wine has acidity. Acidity has, um, brings out this crispness. And then, um, but with a sack style of stereo has a sweetness. So you definitely want a little bit of a perception of sweetness. But then um, what we have determined and, and what we want with this sparkling wine is this thing where it's got this acid, this sweetness, and all of a sudden it's poof, it's gone. And it's like, hey, I want more. <laughs> I hope it expands, I hope it keeps on going. Uh, my biggest goal is, with Zach and Cassie and Ronald, is we want to be one of the largest in the state. And I think we keep plugging along here, especially with the acquisition of Ackerman. It'll probably happen. Pretty big jump. We moved everything from their processing to our processing facility. And um, it's, it's been a little difficult. Instead of having 18 wines, we have 40 wines to make now. 
Um, and so we're bottling every week instead of every other week, and it's been uh, been a little hectic, but it's fun. It's refreshing that you get to be part of this wine industry that I think in 20 years we'll look back and go, we did some really cool stuff. It so far exceeded what I anticipated when I first started the business. That um, I'm, uh, I'm amazed at, uh, at what it's developed. And um, looking forward, I, I think that um, I think that uh, everybody is amazed at this point as to how many wineries have developed, how many have opened, how many grapes were growing, uh, the fact that it's become such an important tourist uh, uh, industry, and not something we ever, we knew it was there, but we didn't realize how important it was going to be, and it's really turned into a big deal. In this area right here along the Mississippi River, uh, people now come down here visiting wineries. That's what they're doing. There's little bitty towns out in the plains out in western Minnesota. Never been any reason to go to those towns until somebody put a winery there. And how many times that's gonna happen, I don't know. Um, I feel like we're just getting started. Our infrastructure here is a lot cheaper than in California. So uh, if you're a California winemaker, you uh, might wanna take, take note of that. Well, at first I never really thought of Iowa as having wineries. I, I didn't know it could be done. I guess I always thought it would be California type, you know, Italy or something. But man, when you find out it's here, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like Field of Dreams. <laughs> Put this up against any French Chardonnay. We are right here. We are this close, you know, with this St. Pepin or this La Crescent. Drinking my champagne. We're this close. This, this could be sitting next to any one of these. I wonder what people in California or France or anybody else would think if we sent them some of our wine blind and say, oh, this, just try it. I'll tell you what it is later, you know. In my blood, it's in my blood. These fields are born upon my blood. I can feel it here and now. I can almost taste the freedom in it. Show. Up at Indian Island Winery um, in Janesville. Today we're finishing up here at Chin Chinkaska Creek Winery, mm -hmm. Chinkaska Creek Ranch Winery at Casoto, um, Minnesota. Minnesota, yes. <laughs> so, the wine's good. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> and uh, we're having a good time. Always been here I stand in the sunshine. Good job. <laughs> Please take a moment right now and get me the hell out of here. I'm still wild. I will never be the same. Across the hills in the dying light, I hear the voices whisper, I'm not alone on a cold blue night. Come to you, like I always do, like you want me to, like you know that I do. Daddy's here, Mama died here, make my way back to you. Yeah.